So this is this kind of an experiment, so just indulge me. I'm going to start by asking a few questions and uh, posing some hypotheses to see where it goes. And I'd like to thank everyone who agreed to be on this panel. Uh, I'm trying to be a kind of representative place of personas and experience. And I'm going to start with some introductions. Let's go down to the line. Um, Brian Merrick is a personal <coughs> hero. And he's, my favorite thing he's done is illustrate the missing values of the manifesto, especially enjoy it. But I'll give you each a minute to kind of introduce yourself. So anything you want to say uh, about yourself, tell us around here. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Classic Brian Merrick. And then we have uh, John House. He's a, a technology director at Analysis. And he's been going to the Adam uh, Roundtable for since the beginning of time. And I'll just give you a second to introduce yourself. Bye. Perfect. That guy's know all about him, right? All right, I'll try to do a better job of introducing him. If that's how you want to play. <laughs> so, uh, Christian's also a regular at the uh, Adam Roundtable. He has a background in the development and, and testing. He's also done some, some training in Adam coaching. You want to say anything about yourself? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Israel Gott. He's got a blog that I love reading now. He's kind of restored my, my faith in executive leadership. Um, Israel Gott is, I don't know, did I do executive? I'll let him say hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Diane Larson. She's, all, she's currently the chair of the Agile Alliance. Um, she focuses on helping people with the human side of software development. I'll be your old white woman. Oh, okay. that That's what I was looking for. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, then, and then we have Mickey Roos. She's also a regular at the Agile Roundtable. She's an Agile Coach uh, Program Manager. She's, she was at Advanced ME, and she was part of the transformation there, and she's currently working at Motorola, helping them become more Agile. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and then, Mike Moore, he's, uh, he's got years of experience as a developer. He's, he's sort of an instigator. He's had podcasts. He's uh, organized the Mountain West Ruby Conference. He's always, uh, he's always fun and cheery. And he's a uh, he's new manager trying to uh, lead a, a team towards Agile at Moses. All right, perfect. So we kind of have a mix of executives, uh, developers, testers, product owner, consultants, various levels and perspectives. So also in the spirit of Agile, and especially this conference, I don't, I don't want to exclude people from the conversation. That's why the mics are out there. So there's plenty of people in this room with a lot of experience, a lot of perspective. So feel free to kind of jump in, uh, either through Twitter or through the mics, and inject your comments and questions. And we'll just kind of make this really organic. And the setup. So everyone kind of has a different role to do. You saw a little bit of this in both of the talks we've seen so far. And this is one of my kind of personal feelings is that when you have these breakdowns in communication between the different personas, it creates the, the word that Sue kept using is an incredible amount of churn. And, and that, that wastes a lot of, of time and energy that you need. But it can be spent basically making software. We're, uh, we're trying to make work in software. And that's, our, that's kind of our value system. So uh, in, in the worst cases, the executives seem distant and removed. The, the developers seem arrogant and dismissive. The product owners uh, can in inappropriately demand specific implementations on one feature and be vague and wishy-washy on the next. And of course, no matter what, everything is always QA's fault. <laughs> <laughs> so on one hand, we think you value individuals and your actions over process and tools. But in reality, uh, we sometimes use process and tools as a shield. Um, tools don't have egos and processes don't disagree with us. So, so we, don't, we kind of stop talking to each other. Uh, so the first question for the discussion is, do you, do you agree with this premise? Um, not necessarily in your organization, uh, mind you. Um, but in general, in, in a hypothetical sense, have you experienced this sort of breakdown in communication between the different levels and personas? And anyone who wants to answer that question today? Or, or just well, start? Okay. And, and part, of the, part of the issue is in the framing of the question. Absolutely. Okay. Always. Um, personas are very useful for us to in, in creating use cases and, and thinking about our customers who might buy our software and stuff. But when we start thinking of each other as personas, 
we're falling into the trap of stereotypes. And the, the biggest indicator of whether or not I trust you is whether I know you as an individual. People don't necessarily trust groups that they don't feel they're a part of. And so as long as we have this have this, this idea of, I mean, and the title of the, of the panel captures it, as long as we have this title of, of we're us and everybody else is them. We've, we've automatically begun the trip down the road to no trust. I would uh, suggest that joint cooperation has perhaps a deeper meaning than we usually realize. When I join a corporation, I do not necessarily sign up to like the person in the next office or in the next department and so on and so forth. However, my signature of the employment contract in many ways is commitment to trust because the interests are mutual. So to me, the two are very, very distinct. There is one thing, whether I like the other person or not, and I have a degree of freedom, to associate with him or not to associate with him. There is quite a different thing by use of being in the same corporation. The fundamental assumption is that we trust each other because we are all working towards the same thing, towards the same end of that. So trust can of course become stronger. Trust can of course be shattered very, very easily. At the same time, the act of joining the corporation to be the act of trust in one another. So I have a question in relation to that. How many of you out here, just quick show of hands, actually trust the people that you're working with, not in your immediate team, but across the organization as a larger whole? Oh, come on now. You really trust? <laughs> How many of us compensate by the work that we do for other groups and other, other teams inside of our environment that we don't quite entirely trust? So trust is obviously important. It's listed in, um, um, it's listed every time that you hear people talking about Agile, you hear about trust, personal safety, things like that. It's an important part of the environment. But the truth of the matter is that most software development environments out there really don't have a sense of trust. They don't have the sense of self, you know, self-actualization. They don't, you know, they're not, they're not striving necessarily to be the best that they can possibly be. So yes, trust is important. You have to build it, but you also have to compensate for situations where the trust doesn't exist tell such time you can build it, or just deal with the fact that it's not going to be there. So I, I have a problem, which is that I don't want to give away anything from my keynote. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, I want to be disagreeable in some way. So uh, let me tell you a story. I was once in her, I was once talking to the CEO of a smallish software company, like a hundred programmers or something. And this was in the 90s when I was a testing consultant. And he said to me regarding testing that testing is like taxes. He viewed the testing budget as like income taxes in the sense that he didn't really know what the money was going for. He suspected that if he did know what the money was going for, he would be unhappy, but he had so much else on his plate that he simply paid his testing tax and let it go. And I realize that back in the days when I had a real job and I was a tester, I actually benefited from that situation in that testing was sufficiently a low status job that none of the executives cared enough about what I was doing to interfere. And as a result, I was able to do a lot of very interesting testing work simply because, not because they trusted me uh, so much, but because they didn't care. So. What I'd like to propose is that some of the problems we have 
is that so many people are working so close to the edge that everybody is sticking their nose into other people's business, making sure that every dime is being spent well and that five levels of management have to sign off on a travel request, that if we simply would just leave people alone, we wouldn't have so much of this problem, if it is indeed a problem that we're talking about. That's the question. Do you think it's a problem? Does anyone think it's a problem? Raise your hand if you think it's a problem. You guys all trust each other, right? Come on. By the way, you're being filmed, and uh, this may come back to bite you later review the time. <laughs> all right, keep your hands down. With uh, facial recognition. <laughs> I would say that uh, the key for me in my career so far to building trust is to actually produce and to uh, have a track record of success. And so I think uh, whenever I have been in a low trust situation, is keep, keep your head down and, and you know, try to actually deliver something. I think maybe you would agree just a little bit. Likely story. I think it's also, um, I don't know that we've had trust issues. I think respect. Um, we trust each other, but we, don't, we may not have as much respect for someone's work or opinion or influence. And so we have to compensate for that and work around that and um, deal with that. So there, this is a question, uh, Alistair has a question. So, so I was listening, is this mic on? No, uh, it's not turning on. You should, you should it's not connected to anything. <laughs> 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 hey, um, what's the other one? I heard it. Oh, situation where there's alleged trust, everybody's really nice to each other, I trust you, and therefore there's no criticism, and the, the part of trust is also being able to, to criticize or raise problems. What about the, the flip side of the tunnel where there's too much alleged trust, and as a result, people don't criticize each other? Yeah, I've worked in large enterprises. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the be nice culture kind of comes along anytime you start growing into a bureaucracy you get that kind of be nice part of the culture. And, um, and, and what happens is that it, there, everything is harmonious on the surface and there's no trust underneath. Because it, since, as a friend of mine says, if you can never say no, your yes doesn't mean much. So if I'm always saying yes, yes, and keeping things harmonious, that means I'm not able to say no, I'm not able to say I don't agree. It's a, it's a mega form of groupthink, right? And it leads us down all kinds of paths we don't want to travel. I would suggest that any culture has some strengths and has some weaknesses. And the situation is quite clear that people are often nice to one another, that can be happens. However, it usually happens in a culture that deteriorates, whether for internal reasons or external, or external reasons. The mic's broken, we can't hear them at all back here. Allow me to start again due to the fact that uh, the device did not work for me. My contention is that every culture has some strengths and every culture has some weaknesses. They are different from one to another. But the situation that Alistair described certainly happens, and it usually happens at the time that a culture like a collaboration culture deteriorates. So the thing, the business of the trust, and the business of, uh, you know, artificial trust on the surface, no real trust underneath, can indeed happen. However, a whole bunch of other pathologies happen as a function of other cultures. For example, in a very strong control culture, people oftentimes are afraid to uh, come with bad news because the reaction is so furious. 
So you need to look at the situation when you have what you consider to be trust on the surface, no real trust underneath, in terms of how it falls in the context of the culture that the corporation has. Okay, I'm going to inject a little bit because uh, uh, this is just resonating with uh, a book that I read and uh, I really like. It's called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Do you know that book? So, so this book is it's written by, uh, I'm not certain how to pronounce the last name, but it's Patrick Lencioni, I believe. And it, it builds this model of the five dysfunctions of a team. And it starts at the bottom. This is sort of resonating with what you guys were talking about and even this in the second level. So the, the bottom layer is this absence of trust. That's the first dysfunction. The second dysfunction is a fear of conflict. Third dysfunction, because there's no conflict, there's no real resolution of, of ideas, there's a lack of commitment. People won't commit unless they've actually felt like they can do it. Then, then the fourth layer is there's no accountability. And, and his argument is this, that kind of psychologically, we feel if people haven't committed, then we won't hold them accountable. And then the final dysfunction, which is in, in my mind kind of will go back to the to the first, is not focusing on results. And, and I feel like focusing on results and, and actually I think that's kind of a nice framework, and, and I just wanted to kind of throw it out there, and you guys can, can maybe comment on that. It seems like the direction you're already going. Well, I'm not, I'm not actually going in that direction. <laughs> <laughs> that's because you're Brian Merrick. But Whatever way everyone's swimming, you're going to opposite way. Yeah, so, uh, so to say something against trust uh, for a moment, 20 years ago, uh, a whole ton of people uh, went into Tiananmen Square to protest for democracy. Uh, there go your resale rights to China, by the way. And right now, uh, there are uh, conflicting accounts of lots of people going into the streets of Tehran to do the same thing. So here go the Iranian resale rights. I don't think it's right to characterize what they're doing. And remember that people right this instant are getting beaten up pretty severely in Tehran. And a lot of people died in Tiananmen Square. And I don't believe that they were out there together because they trusted each other so much as that they believed in something that really mattered. So they were willing to go out there without trust. So it's foolish to say, you, know, you shouldn't have trust in teams, blah de blah de blah. Uh, but I wonder to what extent we are using trust to substitute for the fact that our work doesn't matter to us. The thing we're producing doesn't matter to us. It doesn't seem real, it doesn't seem valid, it doesn't seem important. So we're sublimating our desire for to uh, telegraph the message, art artisanship, by retreating to interpersonal uh, communications, interpersonal reactions that are supposed to substitute for the fact that we don't feel a sense of accomplishment. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think that uh, if you're using trust to isolate yourself from change, then that's probably a bad thing. And that, uh, like you said, you need to stand on some principles. Um, so, I mean, one of, I feel weird being here because I don't really come from a, an agile background, um, and uh, I haven't really been, uh, had any success in agile for a long time. I've been the uh, guy at the very bottom. That's why you're here. <laughs> Uh, kind of yelling up and saying, you know, let's let's do this, let's try this, let's pair, let's get a CI server, you know, let's let's start testing and all these other things. And I've had like zero success in my career. And then uh, I got I got made a manager like two months ago, and it's been it's been like so easy to you know set up a uh, continuous integration server and and to implement pairing and to start testing more. You got smarter. And, yeah, I suddenly just got smarter with the, with the title. And so I, I think to your point though. I could have just said, well, the entire team and really company works this way, and I'm going to trust that they know what they're doing. And uh, I said, no, I mean, you know, I, I, this is my one opportunity, and 
and I should take advantage of it and I should be a pain in the ass and start making change. So, yeah, so to the extent that it allows me to do that, I would agree with you. Jim Heistmate. Jim Heistmate has a beautiful slide that I would like to do justice to, even verbally. It shows a caveman with uh, a spear, a dagger, or both, sitting in front of a PC and, you know, joyfully putting it through. And the quip that goes with it, and Jim literally asks it in uh, various occasions to the audience, how many of you come on Monday morning to the office desiring to do poor quality work? The fact of the matter, I have never, in any of the times that I have seen this question asked, I have never seen a person raise his or her hand and say, hey, I do. So the issue to me is about the way, uh, and I would say executives like myself and others, set the system. Namely, if the mindset is that those idiots uh, down the aisle will never be able to crawl out of a big brown bag with a hole in the middle of it, then there is no way to make any progress in terms of agile or any other software method. If, on the other side, the person in charge has the humility, the strength and the introspection to say, I set up things in some false manner. I made this error, I made this, uh, that error. Those people who come on Monday morning to do high quality work are not getting there because of something that I heard in setting, then you can start knocking one thing after another and improving. But in terms of the base material, if you please, that we all work with, I am very, very hard pressed to think about any person that I had known during my career who did not come with best intentions about quality or whatever he or she were doing. Which reminds me, I mean, we. Um Alistair referred this morning to some of the lean principles and how that's being um, becoming part of Agile. And, and when I think of lean, I think of sort of my favorite part of lean, which other than the definition of perfection, is, is the, um, the good fortune I had to take some trainings from Ed Edwards Deming. And, and when I, and his, um, his assertion always was that it's, it's not about the individuals, it's about how the system is created. And that there is enough, I won't go so far as to say drive, but I will say influence, that systems influence behavior to such an extent that if there is something going wrong, look to the system, not to the people. What is it in the system that is causing that, inducing that behavior? And, and then he, you know, and then in, in his 14 points, he also talks about driving fear out of the workplace and a bunch of other really good advice. So if, you're, if you haven't read Deming's 14 points for managers, do that and take them to heart because that in itself is setting up the conditions for success. And, and I think, it's, it's, there's a, a lot of tension right now, frankly, in, in Agile between those who would like to see it stay really focused on, on the people who are getting the software out the door, which is the development team, and rightly so, that needs a focus, because without putting the, the software out the door, none of us have work, um, and those who are saying, but wait a minute, we have to create the conditions for success, and that's the job of other people in the organization than just the dev team. And so we are, you know, we are um, dealing with a paradox where we can't focus one place or the other. We have to focus on both simultaneously, and that takes us to the system. So getting better at thinking in terms of our systems and in what our systems are doing um, also has an influence on some of these other things that we're taking, talking about here. That would suggest that we should drop individuals from individuals and interactions over processes and tools. It should just be interactions over processes and tools. I suggested that a couple there's, of years there's ago. There's a second. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think
think, I think this is pointing to one of the fundamental um, issues that doesn't get addressed all that often about Agile, and that is that uh, it's kind of self-selecting. If you're doing Agile right, you have certain qualities and personality, you have certain aspects of the culture that you've accepted. Um, one of the things that you just mentioned is the fact that you are willing to drive fear out of your workplace. How many of you that work for a large corporation are willing to tilt against that big of a windmill in your workplace? The fear of going to your boss and reporting to them that, uh, you know, that, that uh, you're going to be late or something along those lines. I, I would propose that we're a self-selecting community. The people that are capable of doing this, the people that care about software beyond the point where they're collecting their paycheck, we're the ones that are going to do these things. We're willing to walk in, we're willing to tilt at the windmills, we're willing to fight these battles, even though we know that it's going to be hard at, at the best of times, it's going to be impossible at the worst of times. But what happens to us? In, in a large organization, in, in, in your groups, how many people really care about software? Care about it beyond when they're at their desk, eight to five. They, they care about it beyond the time that they're at their desk, eight to five. They care about it beyond the fact that it gets out of their department. How many of you really see that in the larger software development community? Or do you see it in this room, in a smaller community of people that care? That's the fundamental assumption I think is missing. People say, oh, we're going to do Agile, we're going to adopt Agile, but what they don't understand is that there's a cultural adoption that sits underneath this that requires certain things that you have to care. You have to have courage. You have to be willing to make mistakes. You have to be willing to change. And I would say that the larger community a lot of these skills are not present, and they're going to be awfully hard to teach. So, so are you suggesting that Agile hasn't crossed the chasm? I am suggesting that Agile will never cross the chasm. Whoa. <laughs> so I'm going, to, I'm going to go back and ask a question to kind of uh, stimulate things. Um, in, in the experiences you've had, Experienced the, the kind of blame game hot potato, and, and at that point, uh, you kind of, your teams are going to stop focusing on what I call kicking donkey, and uh, they instead focus on covering donkey. And, and you, at, once that cycle starts, have you ever seen anyone get out of it? And how would they do that? What? <laughs> I'll leave it to your imagination, Brian. I, I don't understand what kicking donkey would mean. What's another word for donkey? Oh, I get it. <laughs> I'm from the Midwest. We're slow. Let me pick on Vicky. So I was at an organization a while ago, and at the time I would classify it as very little responsibility on the dev side. Um, there was one tester in the org and probably 50 or 60 developers. And um, <laughs> what would happen is, 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 is and this wasn't an agile, so I, okay, I'll, really? yeah, okay. Um, so what, one of the things that happened was uh, management chose to go down the witch hunt road to try to get that responsibility. And um, there was a time when I would actually say that I felt like the developers felt more responsibility, but then there was a time where that crossed the line and nobody was productive anymore because they were too worried about, um, you know, getting fired. Um, and, uh, and, and that's the environment that it was, by the way. It was very much a if you, we will let somebody go every so, so many months. And, uh, you know, everyone on it, one person from every team, depending on how big the team is, you know, a certain percentage will be let go. And, and started, what happening is people st stopped helping each other. Um, but but it, it did turn into a spiral and I ended up leaving um, and went under greener pastures. But I, I will say that I felt that at the time there was actually a point where I think that they might have been able to turn it around. Where, Doing such a thing, contrary to what I would like to believe, doing such a thing did make a difference. But they kept doing it. They, they surpassed that line. 
so just to reiterate a point that Diana made, do you feel like that is kind of reinforcing this idea that it's the system and not the individuals? Uh, yeah, possibly. I have the fortune that my 15-year-old son is for one year in Japan as an exchange student this year. So I am learning and experiencing Japan through his uh, fresh eyes. And problems, of course, come up in school or in some of the clubs that he goes to or with the host family. It does not make uh, things that are not different than in the Midwest or on the East Coast or the West Coast here. What I am immensely impressed time and time again is the ability to fix the things without putting a blame on a certain person. Namely, the business of resolving a situation without making an individual, a teacher, a counselor, a host mom or the like, feeling completely guilty and, uh, you know, helpless in terms of everyone turning on her is most impressive. It takes a lot of time and sometimes uh, my wife or myself lose a little bit of patience till something gets resolved. So I have seen time and time again things get resolved without placing blame and this makes a tremendous difference in the way things move forward there. So I, I still want to get somebody here mad at me. So. <laughs> Let me continue to attack trust, in some sense. Uh, my, my wife, the veterinarian, has access to what they call euthanasia fluid. Uh, however, I have never before this moment said that I trust her not to use it on me. <laughs> and here's another thing that, that I've never told 200 some odd people before. One time I was, I, I came back from a trip and we were unpacking my suitcase and we discovered a pair of woman's black underwear in my suitcase. And this did not lead to a conversation like, I trust you, husband, that there's a legitimate explanation for this underwear in your suitcase because there isn't. I have no idea to this day how it arrived in my suitcase. It turned immediately into a joke. So I, I want to posit that, that the more we talk about trust, the more it's a sign that we don't actually have any of it. Who wants to follow up there? Brian, as, as you were talking, that's what I was going to say. It, it's funny how we have to say, I trust you, but um, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. And, and I agree that, uh, that, that, yeah, anyways, it seems like we are using trust to go back to your, to your previous thing, possibly as an excuse. But I think it's also something that's very important to build. Um, I, I don't know that you, uh, to, to a certain point, you, if you have a team of people that, that uh, to say it's a self-organizing team and, and everybody has different opinions and everybody goes off and does their own thing, uh, the same exact work, at what, at what point do you have to get together and say, hey guys, let's, let's build this concept of a team and I am able to handle this component and you're able to handle that component and hey QA, you know, you are hired because of this, uh, you, you, can, you can test this. I, I'm, I'm with Mike. Thing Mike said that uh, trust is essentially delivery on your commitments. I, I'd like to make one small ad addition to that, which is trust, or whatever thing it is that we're trying to talk about under the, the rubric of trust, is evidenced by someone on your team or someone on, someone who's work affects you, doing something for you that inconveniences them. So Lisa Crispin, uh, co-author of the book Agile Testing, uh, which is a really good book, um, talks often about the way that 
the people on her team will do jobs that aren't really their job just because other people in the team need help. And I think these activities, these visible activities are the, the most important thing. And the words behind them are, are not. The one thing we have to keep in mind is that the word trust is a very loaded concept. And trust itself isn't that interesting. It is what you trust. I can trust a coworker to do his job. I can trust a coworker to go beyond the, the call of duty and do everything that is necessary to deliver. I can, another, I can trust another coworker to lie to me every time I tell him, or every time he tells me when something's supposed to be delivered. It's what we trust in each other that's important to the team, not the fact that we just trust each other in general. Let's hear from Jeff real quick. Okay, so I'm mad at you, Brian, just, just for the, uh, throwing that out there. So I, I found the, as a long-term agilista, I found, uh, self-proclaimed, by the way, I found the, uh, the last few discussions uh, somewhat disturbing because I'm thinking like we're going kind of on an orthogonal path to the, what I see as the, the strength of agile. I see the strength of Agile being the engagement that happens between the members of the team and people outside the team, between the customer, and, and you know, the trust, it either is going to be there, it's going to grow, it's going to decline, I don't really care. But if we're engaged, we're going to find out and we're going to work with that. So I think, I think this should be a discussion more about engagement than about trust. What do you mean by engagement? Uh, well, I think, okay, so for example, at management, I believe, uh, is very good at engaging with their employees because that's their job, right? However, I think those uh, developers, and especially perhaps because of their personality traits, I have a hard time engaging with those outside. They become very insular and, and, and have a hard time engaging with those outside the team, outside the company, uh, at conferences like this, <laughs> uh, that kind of engagement that interpersonal engagement that either leads to trust or leads to distrust. And frankly, distrust can be just as useful as trust, you know, depending on who is, okay, sometimes people on my development team, I can't trust them to do something, and that's okay, because that means I just get another guy to do it who I, whom I do trust, if it's mission critical. Is, is it fair to say that, uh, Jeff, is it fair to say that engagement shows trust? I think it makes it, it brings it to light, whether you trust or not, if you engage. If you disengage, your only options are to not to trust until you know more information. Because I, I, I don't know, maybe this is extreme, but I, I don't know if I engage with somebody I don't trust. So the, the act of engagement is showing trust. Someone has to take the first step. <laughs> I, I just want to interject one thing, because I, I think that you guys might be arguing semantics a little bit. And, and why, this is obviously taken on a life of its own, but kind of my original concept is you have these roles and the, the fidelity of the, the bandwidth or the communication between those roles is, is what determines a, a high functioning agile team from, from a dysfunctional agile team. And that's sort of my, my starting premise. And we've kind of gone onto trust, but I, I think I, on some level with Jeff, that it's all about um, what he's calling engagement. I think of this kind of high bandwidth communication between the different roles. Let me recount an episode. <laughs> from a company which definitely at the time was not agile, and this is Microsoft. I was working for them at the time that the antitrust uh, was uh, going on, and the ruling was to break the company. And productivity across the corporation went down the drain for the simple reason that everyone and his grandmother were spending all the time speculating about will the lawyers manage to turn things around or will they not manage to turn things around. Bill Gates, who always was extremely involved, got together a bunch of us and basically tell us, guys, you have got to trust the lawyers to turn the jurisdiction around, just they need to trust you to produce the code. And in one short meeting with this uh, motive, he really changed things around a big time. What would have happened if the decision was not turned around, I don't know. But in terms of the productivity across the corporation, in 30 minutes, possibly even less than that, we changed things drastically by pointing out what trust really means in the context of a corporation. I like the premise of the question as well. I think that's
that's one of the things that we kind of do, is kind of skirt around, is kind of the human element of producing software. That's one of the things that I really liked about Agile when I was first learning about it, was it seemed like it focused on the individuals over process, and it focused on more than just writing the code, on the process of writing code and how you deal with other people to get to the end goal, right? And uh, I do think that Agile is definitely missing that. I, uh, I have ran a, a couple of podcasts, and one of the things I like to talk about was talk about Agile, let's talk about the practices, let's talk about you know how you adopt it, everything else. And I got lots of email and communication coming back from that, saying that people were just really sick and tired. And these are really your target audience. These are the developers who are going to be the ones who write the, the code, right? And they're sick to death of hearing about Agile. You know? So I think, to take on, on Brian's thing, to get you guys mad, I kind of think Agile's broken, right? So let's throw it out there. I think that Agile is uh, not what it was intended to be. And that's one of the things, one of the reasons I was really excited for the Agile roots. Let's, let's get, go back to where it started. And so I'll throw that out there. Is Agile broken? I was in a conversation with some people in Portland about a year ago, and, and I asked that question. And I said, I've been hearing a lot that Agile has crossed the chasm, and I don't know what I'd look for to know that. And what do you all think has Agile crossed the chasm? And um, a very wise person in the group looked at me and said, well, the word has crossed the chasm. The, the actual, you know, doing of it is still somewhere on the other side, right? And so I think that, you know, it, it's, it has become a buzzword and people react to buzzwords and, you know, there was a time when empowerment was the big bad buzzword. And, I mean, it, these things run in cycles. So what I'd like to do is go to an example of uh, what you said was the, the, the title of this talk. There's only us. So an example of a time when, when there was only us um, is this, a wonderful story that I heard recently about an organization that um, was embarking on quite a large project that had a lot of subparts. And they knew they were going to have to, to field about probably six or seven teams. They weren't exactly sure. So they got everybody in the room, the whole development organization, all the managers, everybody in the room, and they described the nature of the project and what they were trying to produce. And they asked the people in the room, so how do you think we should organize this? What's the best way? You know, how should, how should we put the teams together and stuff? They had some conversation, they figured out what teams they were going to need in order to, to roll up into this larger project. And then the manager said, okay, we're leaving the room now, and when we come back, we expect that all of you will have organized yourselves into the teams you want to work on and that you're best suited for. And they left. And they came back 20 minutes later or half an hour later, and they had their teams, and everybody started work. Now, that... To me, that's the example of engagement, trust, no fear, I mean, all of these things we've been talking about, that's, that's how that works, is when you can see that kind of thing in action in an organization. All right, we can take another minute or two before lunch. Um, if you guys have anything to say, I know you, you came up, so let's hear from the audience, but if you have a last word or something you want to get in. All right, so my question is, oh, hold on a second. Um, so Paris Hilton wants her underwear back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so my question is, and maybe this flies in the face of there's only us. It seems that over the course of perhaps the past decade, a lot of development teams and a lot of development organizations have undergone a lot of and the organizations, the large organizations that we live in, were built around the assumption that the development group is, in fact, the bottleneck constraint. And I'd like to ask the, the panel, are you seeing situations where 
that was the case, the development group was the bottleneck constraint. It no longer is the case. And how is the organization that was structured around that basic assumption dealing with that? Because now something else must be the bottleneck. All right, my work here is done. <laughs> could, you, could, you, could you elaborate one or more two sentences to give us uh, a better understanding of the question? Yeah, so in an organization whose main business is producing software, for example, there are all these other activities that go around you know, the, the guys who are coding, right? There are people figuring out, well, what's the market? There are people you know, going out and finding customers. There are people shepherding perhaps the introduction of the software into the environment and the customers. All of these other things that happen that are not the guys with the fingers on the, on the keyboards and the, and the product owner working with them and all that sort of thing. And it used to be the case, I think, in a lot of situations that all of those other functions could operate under the assumption that what is going to take the most time, what is going to restrict our ability to bring product to market, to bring value to market, is the speed at which the development group can actually build the thing. And I think in some cases, uh, in many cases, where you have teams that are delivering uh, releasable software every week or two weeks, it's a very different situation than when, well, our next release is 24 months from now. What sort of pain points have you been finding outside of the development group trying to adjust to the fact that, wait, got another release, it's, a, it's only been two weeks since the last one. Uh, or, for instance, well, we, we don't have time to do proper market research. Are you, are you seeing things like this? And what are people, how, how are successful groups adapting? You know, I, I think that the, the presupposition of that statement is that there are successful groups that are adapting, and that implies uh, what Alistair mentioned in his keynote, the fact that you are looking for the bottlenecks and you're solving them, you're moving the bottlenecks around the company, so to speak, ideally trying to get, them, get rid of them at some point, but you know, how often does that actually happen? But there's the other side of it too, and this is the unsuccessful companies, and I think that rather than a removal of bottlenecks, it's just simply an accept acceptance of the fact that the bottleneck is always there and it will never go away, and that's the other side of the coin. So in a successful company, yes, but how many companies are really successful in delivering software on a frequent basis? I certainly see uh, such instances, and my sense is that the most painful point is around a contract, a contract to produce software. The terms and the uh, progression of the law simply is used behind these of the agile methodology or other methodologies. I will give you an example from a recent bid that I was involved in. I got the RFP and while reading it, there were two clauses there that really struck me no end. One was that they expect the vendor to be agile. If the vendor is not agile, he or she can provide an explanation how they would go about it. But basically, the clause is clear. If you are not doing agile, don't bother. There was another clause there that said working software every week, a drop every week into the data center. So I was, uh, you know, impressed no end and came to the meeting for the organizations that issued the bid with extremely high expectations. Only to find out that there was a total disconnect between the state of their, or state of mind at least of their attorneys, and the state of mind of the people who were, really, who were uh, running IT for them. So we run into those things within the corporation, and no doubt about it. I was in a situation where I was told by marketing Israel, you guys are uh, shipping software faster than we can market it. Those, however, are relatively easy to deal with. The painful one is when it comes to two legal entities who needs to agree on what needs to be done through an agile contract. And actually, in this very city, 
Uh, a lot of work has been done by Alistair and some of his colleagues about the various ways in which you structure the agile contracts. So if there is one pain point which I would say can make decisive difference in agile crossing the chasm, is contract law catching up with agile concepts. Here's what I propose. I have, I have a lot of threads kind of rolling around in my head, and I, I want this guy that's got up in the middle to ask his question, but there's only us, and I think we're getting hungry. So what I want to do is, is have him introduce kind of a new thread, and then we'll take this discussion, hopefully from here, to lunch, and everyone can talk about it with everyone on the panel. And also, there's a social tonight that everyone can talk about it even more. So, wow, a lot of pressure. Um, <laughs> so I've, I've had the pleasure of working with a, a lot of different Agile teams in one form or another, and <clears throat> sometimes we do it well, oftentimes um, we don't do it well uh, for one reason or another. And um, when we're not doing it well, sometimes you might even accuse us of, of cargo culting, you know, where we're kind of going through the motions, we're putting on the earphones, waiting for the plane to land, and nothing's happening. Um, I have conflicting feelings about that, and I was curious about yours, in that we, we introduce Agile to these organizations, and they put on the earphones, and they stand in the runway, and they wait for something to happen. And, and sometimes I think, yeah, that's the right start. At least they're waiting, you know, at least we've, we've, we've given them the tools. But other times I'm thinking, this isn't ever going to go anywhere. So you're trying to say Agile isn't uh, having stand-ups and stop writing documentation that you've done? Yeah. Tomorrow, uh, bring your laptop and have it set up to code and test. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>